In this video, we work some additional examples of integration by substitution. These integrands involve exponential functions. So we've got this problem. Uh, again, we say to ourselves, do I have a rule for that? And when I look at that anti or that integrand, I say no. Um, I've got a quotient here. We don't have a quotient rule for antiderivatives. Um, but um, given that I don't have a rule for that, we do have u substitution. That's our most advanced technique so far. So if I'm going to use u substitution, I need to look for a function nested inside another function. So I'm going to choose u equals that e to the or u equals that three divided by x as my u. Now remember, we can rewrite that as three times x to the negative one using our exponent properties. Uh, one divided by x to the first is x to the negative one. So that three divided by x to the first is three times x to the negative one, having a problem with glare again. All right. Maybe I need to use this uh, blue instead of the uh, red. That's better. Okay, so if you have one over x to the n, that's the same as x to the negative n. If we rewrite this u as three times x to the negative first, we can use the power rule to take the derivative. So we'll let u be that inside function, and then du is three times the exponent times x to the one less power. So negative one minus one is negative two times the derivative of the inside. Now, because of this property, we can rewrite this x to the negative two as one divided by x to the positive two. So we've got negative three times one divided by x to the second. And if we multiply straight, straight across here, we have negative three divided by x squared dx is our du. And we say, do I have this up here as a factor? And I don't, I have something close. I've got an x squared in the denominator and a dx but I don't have that negative three. So you can say, okay, well, how do I get rid of the negative three factor on this side? Well, let's multiply both sides by negative one third. And that negative three and that negative one third will reduce. Negative three divided by negative three is one. And so we have negative one third of du equals positive one divided by x squared dx. And I'd say, but what about the four? I want a four there in the denominator. Well, we can get a four in the denominator if we want to. Just so have to multiply by one fourth on both sides. And so we end up with negative one twelfth of du is one divided by, if we multiply straight across, four x squared times dx. So I've got that four x squared in the denominator times dx. That is an extra factor multiplying that e to the u. So we can rewrite everything in terms of u now. We can write this as e to the three divided by x times one over four x squared times dx. And this turns out to be negative one twelfth of du. And this turns out to be an e to the u. And so these integrals are equal to each other. Um, but uh, remember the original integrand or the original integral was a definite integral. So this says start at x equals one and go to x equals uh, three and find that net area under the curve. Since this function is positive the whole time, it's gonna end up being the uh, area between the y-axis and this function on the interval from x equals one to x equals three. Well, that integral in terms of x is equivalent to this integral in terms of u. We just need new bounds for u. These are x values. We need bounds that are actually u values. To find the bounds for u, we substitute the bounds for x into this equation for u. So we've got u is three divided by x. And to find the new upper bound and the new lower bound, I substitute the original upper bound and lower bound into this function. So my original upper bound was three. So then I, I have u evaluated at x equals three is three divided by three, which simplifies to one. And then my original lower bound was one, if I evaluate uh, this expression, three divided by x at x equals one, I just get a three. So this was my original upper bound. So this is my new upper bound. So I've got a one as my upper bound. This is a value for u, which is what we want because we have, oops, this was still a function of x. So we're going from x equals three to x equals one. Now, when we've got our integral entirely in terms of u, we, we're going from u equals uh, 
three, which is our new lower bound. to u equals uh, one. So we integrate from three to one, uh, this negative one twelfth of e to the u. If it bothers you that that um, lower bound is higher, is a, a larger number than that upper bound, you can multiply this equation by negative, or you can multiply the integral by negative one as long as, and flip those. So if you prefer, you can call that one twelfth of the integral from one to three of e to the u to u. And then you say, do I have a rule for that? And we sure do. So we compute the antiderivative. So we have one, the antiderivative of 1 12th e to the u is 1 12th e to the u. Then we evaluate at 3 and 1 and subtract. I'll factor out the 1 12th. So I'll have e cubed minus e to the first, which is just 1 12th of e cubed minus e. And that is the value of our integral. So let's review what we just did. We said, OK, do I have a rule for that? No. So we um, are, decide to use u substitution. So we're going to choose u. We compute du, and then we simplify. We're trying to get that 1 over 4x squared dx. So we had to multiply by negative 1 third and then multiply both sides by 1 fourth to get that 1 over 4x squared times dx here. So we'll solve for 1 over 4x squared dx. OK. And then you write everything here in terms of u. So whenever you do that, you need a new integrand. You need a new. You need this dx in terms of u. So you're going to have a function of u times du, and then you need bounds in terms of u. All those bounds are limits of integration. Then we've got our integral in terms of u. So we anti-differentiate and then evaluate f at the upper limit and the lower limit and subtract. Now, notice that we do not have to go back to x, and we don't have to replace u with this uh, 3 divided by x again, like we did with the other anti-differentiation problems. Since this is integration, we're actually taking this area, uh, this, this region, that's bounded above by this function and to the left and right by x equals 1 and x equals uh, 3, and then bounded below by y equals 0. We're transforming it into a new region. It's the area under the curve of 1 12th e to the x from x equals 1 to 3. It turns out that the area under the curve of 1 12th e to the x from x equals 1 to 3 um, gives us this area that's the same as the value of this area. So we're sort of changing, we're sort of almost warping the um, area. We're changing this function into this sort of equivalent function, and it turns out uh, that we get the same value for the area. All right, now if we want to visualize that, um, I don't actually know what that looks like without a graphing calculator. Um, we can go to Desmos and look at the graph. So this turns out to be our region. When I graph f of x, it looks like this. It looks like it's zero until we get to zero, and then it's got this asymptote. As uh, It looks like as x approaches zero, this is undefined. Uh, but it's actually kind of uh, far away from x equals 0 at first. But if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that that seems to approach the y-axis. It just doesn't approach it very fast, at least um, in the vicinity of 0, uh, or in the vicinity of like low uh, values of y, where, where our y values are between 0 and 5 in this case. So if we want this, um, the value of this integral, we um, look at the region uh, between, or we look at the, we shade the region, between y equals 0 and y equals f of x, and the vertical lines x equals 1 and x equals 3. So we're looking for the, that teal region. And we did all of our computation already. We know that the answer is supposed to be 1 divided by 12 times e cubed minus e. And we see that we get the uh, exact same answer that they get um, when they evaluate the integral. When I say they, I mean Desmos. Um, is giving us that numerical approximation of that. And it turns out to be the same as the decimal approximation of our exact answer. Um, but we can see what that region looks like. Now, if we wanted to, we could graph that 1 12th e to the x and look at the area under the curve for 1 12th e to the x. We don't have to, though. Uh, I am actually curious about that. Let's, let's look at what g of x equals 1 12th e to the x looks like. So there's our 1 12th e to the x. 
Now, if I look at the region, shade the region between what, uh, letting y go between zero and g of x on the interval from x equals one uh, to x equals three, I have that area. And what we've shown is that that orange area is the same as that teal area. And we have a basic rule for the antiderivative of g of x, and we did not have a basic rule for the antiderivative of e to the three divided by x, all divided by four x squared. Um, so that's why we did the change of variables. I said uh, g of x equals 1 12th e to the x rather than g of u equals 1 12th e to the u. But graphically, um, it's going to be the same. Uh, we're just using x instead of u. Uh, it's this, this, we're thinking of x as a dummy variable of integration. Um, so this, again, the orange area is equal to the teal area. All right, let's do another problem. Uh, this is a e to the secant of 2x times secant of 2x times tangent of 2x dx on the interval from pi over 3 to pi over 2. The graph is kind of weird. This this purple graph is actually the um, e to the uh, 2x times secant of 2x tangent of 2x. So we've got all these sort of weird asymptotes that uh, occur when the uh, secant of 2x and tangent of 2x are undefined, which is when cosine of 2x equals 0. And we have this exponential expression. But if I graph that on the interval from uh, pi over 3, x equals pi over 3 to x equals pi over 2, that turns out to be the region. So we're trying to find that, that area. And we can find that area using u substitution. So I'll, I'm going to do that on paper with you. OK, so we've got an exponential and a sine of or a secant of 2x and a tangent of 2x. And you might say, OK, I don't have a basic rule for that because I've got a product. Do I have an inside function? And we say, well, yeah, I've got a, a lot of inside functions. I could let my inside function be 2x. I could let my inside function be secant of 2x. Now, you could do uh, u equals 2x. And then we'd have a e to the secant of u times secant of u times tangent of u times a multiple of dx or a multiple of du. But we don't have a basic rule for that either. So we want to choose a u um, so that when we're done, when we're done rewriting the integral, we actually have a basic rule for that. Um, with that in mind, I think I want to use uh, u equals secant of 2x. Because I know the derivative of secant is secant times tangent, and I've got a secant times tangent right there. So let's let u equal secant of 2x. The derivative of u is going to be the derivative of secant, which is secant of the inside function times tangent of the inside function. Put the inside function back inside and multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. The derivative of 2x is a 2, and du is that expression times dx. And you say, OK, do I have a secant of 2x tangent of 2x dx? And we do. We don't need the two. Um, so to get rid of the two, we'll multiply both sides by one half. One half of du turns out to be secant of 2x tangent of 2x dx. So this piece is one half du. And we're multiplying this e raised to the u power. So I'm just replacing this with u. And I'm replacing this with one half at du. So it's a very simple basic rule. You do have a basic rule for that. The antiderivative of one half e to the u is going to be one half e to the u. But we need new bounds. These are x values for the bounds. And we need uh, u values for our bounds. So we will evaluate u at the upper bound to get the new upper bound for our u substitution problem. So we have u is um, secant of 2 times the angle. And then our angle for our upper bound was pi over 2. Uh, the two's reduced, and so we end up with secant of pi. Secant is one over cosine. So this is one divided by cosine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative one. So this is one divided by negative one, which is negative one. Now to get our new lower bound, we evaluate u at pi over three. So we've got secant of two times pi over three. Well, that's 1 divided by cosine of pi over 3, or excuse me, cosine of 2 pi over 3. You say, well, what does that look like? Well, we don't actually remember, but I know 2 pi over 3 is in quadrant 2. 
it's two thirds of pi. And that means that this is one third of pi. And one third of pi is 60 degrees. So that's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Opposite the 60 degree angle is a square of uh, a side or a, a side uh, with length square root of three. Opposite the 30 degree angle is a side with length one when the hypotenuse is two. So these are the ratios or the appropriate um, ratios between the sides. Um, but notice we're in quadrant two. So our X value is gonna be negative and our Y value is positive. So you say, okay, well, what's the cosine then? Well, the cosine is the adjacent over hypotenuse using this reference triangle. So we get a negative one half. So we've got one divided by negative one half, which gives us a negative two. You say, okay, well, what does our integral look like then? Well, the original integral had these bounds for x. Our new lower bound is negative two. Our new upper bound is negative one. And then this is an e to the u times a one half du. So I'll factor out the one half and we get that. Say, okay, do I have a rule for that? Yes. The antiderivative of one half e to the u is one half e to the u. Then we evaluate that at u equals negative two and u equals negative one half or negative one and we subtract. So we have one half e to the negative one minus e to the negative two. And that's our final answer. You can write that as one over e and one over e squared if you want to. If you want, you can get a common denominator, um, but I don't think that's necessary. And that is the exact area under the curve. And I'm not sure what that is, uh, but we can evaluate that using our calculator on Desmos and see if we get the same uh, decimal approximation um, as Desmos has. Um, so let's do that. So we used U substitution and we got a final answer of one half e to the negative one minus e to the negative two. And that's the same area that we um, got using the Desmos uh, graphing calculator to do the integration for us. Now, all those calculations that we talked about are in this graph. Uh, I guess it's really more of a web page. Um, and so we can see writing the integral in terms of u, computing the antiderivative, and then evaluating the antiderivative at the upper limit and lower limit and subtracting. And we see that we get the same answer. All right, cool. So that was another problem from 5.4. And here's another one. This one actually is not from the text. Um, I made this one up. So we have the integral from nine to 16 of e to the square root of x divided by square root of x times dx. I actually think I took an antiderivative problem and added some bounds. So let's do this one by hand. Um, one thing that we um, notice is if we want to, we can uh, visualize the region. So here's my function, e to the uh, square root of x divided by square root of x. It has an asymptote when x equals zero because then the integral is undefined. Um, and then the curve actually looks like uh, that, that purple dotted line. And then on the interval, the, the curve looks like this. And so that is actually the area we're trying to find. According to Desmos, the value of that area is approximately 69 uh, square units. So let's see if we get the same answer when we do the U substitution on paper. And we'll probably get an exact answer in terms of E, and then we'll type that into Desmos to see if uh, ours are equivalent. Our answer is equivalent to theirs, I mean. Okay, so we look at this integrand and we say, do I have a rule for that? We say no, because why? Well, we don't have a quotient rule for antiderivatives. So we're gonna let u equal uh, the inside function. And we're using u substitution again because it's our most advanced rule. When we get to calculus two, two we're gonna learn lots of other rules. So we might use those rules instead, but here, if our basic rules don't apply, we almost always go to u substitution. So I say u equals the square root of x, which is the same as x to the one half power. When we compute du, we have to use a power rule. We have one half x to the one less power, uh, one half minus one is negative one half, multiply by dx. And then we have to remember um, this x to the negative one half power is actually one divided by x to the one half power. And the exponent property or the uh, rational, uh, well, the rational exponent property that I used here is x to the m divided by n is the nth root of x to the m, the index, of the root goes in the denominator and whatever that exponent is on the x inside goes in the numerator. Now there's an implied one on that x inside. So that's that 
the one in the numerator. And whenever we have a square root, that's an implied two. The so square root is a one half power, just using that rule. And then we've got that. And you say, okay, well, this X to the negative one half can be rewritten as one half times one divided by X to the one half or the square root of X if you prefer. And so now you've got one divided by two times the square root of X uh, times DX equals DU. You say, do I have this up here somewhere? Say, so, yes, actually I do. I don't have the two, but I've got the square root of X in the denominator and the DX. Now, some students get confused and they say, well, what about the one? Remember, that's a fraction. If we multiply straight across, um, we'll have a one times some other numerator there. And that, so there, there is an implied one there. We can think of this as a one divided by square root of X times E raised to the square root of X divided by one. Um, so just, just remember that this is not just the square root of X multiplying that exponential. It's a square root of X in the denominator, which means that this, this U substitution actually will work because the derivative of E to the, or the derivative of X to the one half has an X to the one half in it. It's just in the denominator. So you say, okay, I'm trying to get this X to the one half in the denominator or square root of X in the denominator by itself. And I've got this extra two here. I want to get rid of it. So I'm going to multiply both sides by two. And then the twos will reduce on the right. And we'll have one over the square root of X DX is two times DU. Okay, that's cool. All right. So what is the integral in terms of u? Well, this is e raised to the square root of x. And then I'm going to factor out that one over the square root of x times dx. So I have one over the square root of x times dx here. This piece is two to u. So you're just replacing that with two to u. And this is e to the u. So you're replacing the square root of x with u, the e is still there. And I say, okay, that is our integral. But we need new bounds. And um, to find the new bounds for um, u, we have to substitute the original bounds for x. So we've got u evaluated at 16 is the square root of 16, which is 4. 16 was our upper bound, so 4 is our new upper bound. Or actually, this is uh, here. This is still an integral in x, so x is equal 16. x equals 16 is our upper bound here. Uh, u equals 4 is our upper bound there. And then to evaluate or to find our lower bound, we evaluate u at nine. So we've got the square root of nine, uh, which is three. So when x goes from nine to 16, our u values go from three to four. And so you say, do I have a rule for this? At two times the integral of e to the u du from u equals three to u equals four. And we say, yes, we do. The antiderivative of two times e to the u is two times e to the u. We evaluate at three and we evaluate at four and we subtract. So we're gonna have two times e to the fourth minus e cubed, whatever that is. We'll use Desmos to approximate that. And I think they said the area was 69 or something like that. So let's see if we actually get that 69 value. All right. Uh, when I type this uh, answer into Desmos, I get that 69.025. It's just the same value as what we have for this integral here. Now I claim that if I look at the um, area under the curve for uh, 2 times e to the x from x equals 2 or x equals 3 to x equals 4, I get the same thing. Um, so let's let's actually look at that. Let's graph. Let's say y equals... Uh, 2 times e to the x. Let's say I'm interested in the y values or in, in graphing the region where y is between 0 and 2 times e to the x. Oops. On the interval from x equals 3 to x equals 4. And I guess we could use u instead of x. That's what we get. <laughs> it's actually a little bit difficult to see. So they don't know what the uh, y values are there. Maybe we should let our x values go just out to, what was that, 16? So 17. And the x value over here, let's just start at uh, negative 0 0.2 or 0. Point, well, negative 0. Point, or negative 1 is fine. So this is our area. And the claim is that that orange area is that 69.025, just like this teal area is that 69.025. And here we're integrating from three to four. Okay, okay, cool. So the U substitution worked. It got us to a point where we could compute the antiderivative relatively easily. 
And then we were able to substitute in four and three and subtract and get the same value um, for this, um, the area of this region um, that we got for the area of that region over there. All right, now this is a cool one. Um, we've got this, in this problem, we're not actually given an integral, we're asked to find an area. So the original problem statement says, uh, find the area bounded by f of x equals x times e to the negative x squared divided by four, y equals zero, x equals zero, and x equals the square root of x, or square root of six, excuse me. So what I tend to do in class is I graph uh, those four curves, and that's what I've done on Desmos, f of x equals x times e to the negative x squared divided by four, y equals zero, x equals zero, and x equals the square root of six. Now, if we do those one at a time, this is what it looks like. Actually, I want to get rid of that shading. Now, f of x looks like this. Now, I think that might have been one of those that we graphed earlier in the course when we were doing our curve sketching problems. Uh, but just from looking at that formula, that exponential um, times a polynomial in x, we might not actually know that this is what the graph looks like. So I would probably use a graphing calculator for something like this. Um, if I were um, using this function in um, like this type of problem where you're asked to find the area. Um, so I, I type this into my graphing calculator and I see that this is one of my curves. And then I graph y equals zero, that's the x-axis. So I say, okay, if I want the region between um, this function and the x-axis, it looks like I might have this function here or this function here. Say, okay, what else do we need? What are other, our other bounds? Well, x equals zero is one of them. x equals zero is the y-axis. And x equals square root of six is the, another axis. So I want the region bounded by all four of those at the same time, and that's this region right here, between x equals zero and x equals square root of six, and between y equals zero and that curve. So we graph that. There's the f, f on the interval of interest. We shade the region. Uh, we let y go between zero and f of x because f is positive on that uh, interval of x values. And then I like to, to graph that that uh, sort of vertical um, line segment on the right as well. So that is our um, area that we're trying to find. And we can see just from the graph, the x starts at zero and x ends at square root of six. And we're just integrating the function itself. Uh, so we set up the integral as the integral from zero to square root of six of x times e to the negative x squared over four dx. And then we evaluate that using u substitution because, again, we don't have a product rule for an antiderivative, at least not yet. Uh, turns out we never we never have a product rule for an antiderivative, but we do have something that's sort of product rule in reverse-ish um, called uh, integration by parts, which we'll study in calculus too. Blair. Oh, my goodness. I think I just did my entire explanation uh, for myself. So we said find the area bounded by this function, y equals zero, x equals zero, and x equals the square root of x. And we said that that is equal to this integral. So I said, okay, if we want to do that, we need to write everything in terms of u. Rather than having a function of x here and we're um, integrating from x equals zero to x equals the square root of six, we need to integrate from an, a u value to a u value. And we need to write everything here in terms of u. We say, we do, do we have a rule for the antiderivative? No. But if we use a u substitution, we will be able to evaluate the integral. So we say, what is the function inside of another function? Well, we've got this x squared, this negative x squared divided by 4 inside that. So I'll let u be negative x squared divided by 4. Now, that negative 4 in the denominator, you can, or that negative 1 out front, and then that 4 in the denominator, you can think of as a negative 1 fourth times x squared. If you write it like that, it's easier to take the derivative. So we say, okay, well, if u is negative one-fourth times x squared, du is negative one-fourth times the derivative of x squared, which is two times x raised to the one less power, so it's going to be an x to the first, times dx. Two times the negative one-fourth is negative one-half. And so we have a du is negative one-half x dx. We say, do we have a negative one-half x dx up here? We say, no, 
There's no negative one half. So I need to get rid of the negative one half. I can do that by multiplying both sides by negative two. And it turns out that x dx is gonna be negative two times du. So we are literally replacing x dx with negative two times du. We are literally replacing e to this power with e to the u. So we end up with a negative two in front, a du on the right, and this is e to the u. And then we need new bounds. These bounds need to be u values rather than x values. To find the new bounds, we substitute the upper bound for x into the equation for u. When we substitute square root of 6 for x, we get negative 1 fourth times the square root of 6 squared. So it's going to be a 6 times a negative 1 fourth or negative 6 fourths. If we divide the numerator and denominator by 2, we get negative 3 halves or one point, negative 1 1.5. And then if we substitute x equals 0 here, we get a negative 1 fourth of 0 squared, which is 0. So zero is our new up, our new lower bound, negative 1.5 is our new upper bound. Now some students say, oh, I don't like that that negative 1.5 is less than the zero, it bothers me. So they say, okay, that's fine. You can put the negative 1.5 down here. You can flip those as long as you multiply this integral by negative one. So multiplying by negative one, I get a positive two times e to the u. And we're integrating from negative 1.5 to zero. Um, the antiderivative of e to the u is um, e to the u. So we'll have two times e to the u there as our antiderivative. Then we'll evaluate at the upper bound and the lower bound and subtract. We get this, and e to the zero is one. So we get that as our final answer. And then we can use desmos.com to um, approximate that um, and see if we get the same answer as they do um, for their decimal approximation of this integral. So let's do that. So that's our area. And my claim is um, that the uh, value of that integral is 2 times 1 minus e to the negative 3 halves power. And it's, it looks like we get the same decimal approximation. So our answer looks correct. Now, a, another claim is that um, this the area of this region is the same as the area under the graph of y equals um, 2 e to the x. So let's look at y equals 2 e to the x. So it looks like that. And we're interested in that between negative 1.5 and 0. So uh, let's evaluate, or let's graph the region between um, uh, 0, or we want the y values to be between y equals 0, that's the x-axis and uh, 2 e to the x, but only on the interval from negative 1.5 to 0. So let's look at that area. The claim is that that white area is equal to that teal area, and both areas are equal to this 2 times 1 minus e to the negative 3 halves. And it looks right, it looks right to me. It looks like that white area is approximately equal to the teal area. All right. So I think that's it um, for our um, anti-differentiation, excuse me, um, our integration problems. Uh, we use u substitution in a number of them. Remember when you're using, um, when you, your integral has bounds, in order to write an equivalent integral, you need new bounds for your, your variable u. So you, our original um, integral involved uh, functions of x, or at least in the examples that we did today, they all involved functions of x. So it could have been functions of y or functions of a different variable, theta or something like that. Um, but um, usually we've got functions of x there. And so we say x goes from a to, um, x starts at a and ends at b, and then we look at this, the area of this region. Um, we can do that. Uh, but when we rewrite the integral in terms of u, our bounds need to be in, in terms of u. So u needs to start at a value and end at a value. To find those values, we just substitute the original bounds for x into the equation for u, and we get a new upper bound and a new lower bound for u. And then we can evaluate the antiderivative just using our basic rules and then use the fundamental theorem of calculus to get the final answer. And so that's it. I think we're, we're done at least for, with the exponential functions for right now. Um, in the next section, we will look at exponential functions with different bases, as well as a number of applications. Um, now, this is all supplemental. Now, this is not necessary in the Calculus 1 course. And these are just additional problems that you can look at. 
um, that involve those exponential functions if you'd like additional practice. Um, and all of these um, functions, uh, transcendental functions, logarithmic functions, exponential functions, um, inverse trig functions, and the hyperbolic functions are all discussed in chapter five. And it gives us a great opportunity to practice the techniques from earlier in the course um, with those transcendental functions.